the final talk of this evening session is by Andrew Nagy, and his talk is entitled E-Field Effects on F-Region Winds at High Latitudes. Just to prove that we have no favoritism here for the organizing committee, Rick put my paper at the very last, uh, just before dinner, so I'll try to live up to that. The purpose of my uh, brief talk uh, is to demonstrate uh, with the aid of some experimental um, data that in order to study and understand the dynamics of the neutral thermosphere, we have to have detailed information on the convection electric fields and the energy, do, uh, energy due to particle precipitation. I believe that most of you are familiar with what the uh, calculated winds um, would look like if, only, if the only driving force uh, would, be the, uh, uh, would be that due to solar, uh, solar EUV heating. I, do have a, uh, I only have a view graph of it, so not a slide, so I won't bore you with it. Um, the winds predicted by such a model would be blowing from the subsolar point to the antisolar point uh, modified by, some, by the Coriolis forces. So that means that in the northern hemisphere, just to orient you a little bit, we would expect the zonal winds to blow to the east in the evening sector and to the west in the morning sector, and the meridional wind would be blowing in generally to the south in the northern hemisphere during the night. So the, now, what's, what is really the situation, at least at high latitudes? The next few slides will show results of some measurements obtained about a year ago in Alaska, where we simultaneously measured iron drifts and neutral winds. The iron, the iron drifts were obtained using the Chattanooga radar facility, and the neutral winds were obtained by uh, looking at Doppler shifts of some natural emissions, 6300 angstrom emissions from atomic oxygen, oxygen lines. I can see what you mean by not seeing it from the side here. Okay, well, here is the first slide, and um, uh, down here we see the iron drift as measured during the evening sector. Here we have magnetic local time, and the iron drift was to the west, so, uh, turning around and uh, blowing to the east past midnight, very much in... Um, by the way, this is for a specific night, February 27, 1973, but it's representative of... Uh, of all the data obtained, uh, the iron drift kind of following pretty much the convection pattern as predicted. To what the, just this uh, simple-minded diurnal pressure gradient would predict. And switched over around midnight and was uh, much smaller in magnitude but was blowing to the east. Again, the opposite direction from the diurnal pressure gradient driven winds. The next slide shows, um, again, iron drifts obtained here in the bottom scale. Uh, now, this is the meridional component of the drift, and although there was structure in the, uh, in the iron drift, there wasn't, the, the, the net effect uh, was negligible. However, the, um, the neutral wind was fairly large, nearly 200 meters per second, in the post-midnight sector, but if anything, slightly to the north before midnight. The winds are the winds at 120 kilometers. I'm sorry, perhaps I didn't. These are winds around 200, 250 kilometers. These are thermospheric winds. This is not E-region wind. These are thermospheric winds. They, they are obtained by looking at the Doppler shift of the 6300. Of the 6300 uh, emission. Okay, perhaps I should emphasize it because we've been talking about radar backscatter data kind of pretty much all day, and uh, uh, the kind of thing that Joe Dupnik and so talked about were E region winds, 120 kilometers. This is different. These are not radar backscatter winds. These are 6300 winds from the thermosphere, 200, 250 kilometer winds. So all this is put together in a kind of a uh, Di diagram here, but I tell you what, lateness of the night, let's just skip that. Uh, 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 now here is uh, 
If the pain in your stomach is as bad as mine, then uh, you know what, uh, <laughs> what I mean. Uh, here, are, here are results from five nights in 1972, and, there, um, and um, these are supposedly vectors, and the circle around them uh, is an indication of kind of the, in the uh, estimate of the error bar. I don't know if you can see it way back. Um, and what it wants, uh, what, oh, this is to the north, south, east, west. Now, the point with this kind of mess, mess of vectors, which you, it's difficult to, to see, is that the neutral winds are varying from day to day. I mean, they, there is a significant day to day variation. But if you apply kind of an eye filter to this mess of arrows here, then the kind of thing that you see is that in general, in the pre midnight sector, the neutral wind is blowing to the, to the west and turning southward in the post-midnight sector. Now, again, as I said, there are significant day-to-day -day variations, but, but if you would kind of add them all up and get a general pattern, that's what you would find. So I think, uh, if I can use the word obviously, uh, to carry out uh, any global dynamic calculations of the thermosphere, one has to take into account the convection electric fields and the models which have been, and all the calculations which have been done to date, which only consider the solar EUV pressure-driven winds are inadequate, at least at the higher, uh, higher lat uh, latitude regions. Now, as far as I know, nobody has attempted to do this. And it's not surprising because we don't have enough global information on convection electric fields, and it's just a horrendous problem. But to, to finish off on a kind of a more quantitative than hand-waving basis, what I'd like to, to show you is a couple of slides from some unpublished work of Robel and Hayes. And what they did, in effect, they took the measured electric fields uh, during the night, they took the measured neutral winds during the night, they took effectively an ionization profile, and they fed that into the momentum equation. And, they, and that means that the only unknown left in the momentum equation were, in effect, the pressure gradients, which were not measured. So if they fiddled around with the pressure gradients until the predicted neutral winds were the measured neutral winds. Okay. Now, here is the, could we squeeze it? Ray should be really giving this paper because he knows more about it than I do. Uh, okay, here are, here are the, uh, uh, the, the calculations of the zonal winds. Now, um, this, is, this is the total zonal wind that they calculated, and of course, it matches the observations because that was the, the name of the game. Uh, what, uh, what is plotted in here is what would the neutral wind look like if the, you would only consider, for example, uh, in this case, the zonal winds, if you would only... Uh, uh, consider the electric fields. Well, the, uh, the electric fields would, um, would uh, you know, drive the, drive the neutral wind to the, um, the west in the evening and symmetrically pretty much to the, uh, to the east in the morning. And here they plotted, of course, what the pressure gradients, if only the pressure gradients would be present that they calculated what the winds would uh, be doing, and then putting it together you get the, get the predictions. So. The next uh, slide shows the same thing again for the Meridiano. And um, lateness of time, I think that's enough. Um, uh, now, here, here what, uh, what uh, Ray Robel and Paul Hayes have plotted, uh, as I said, what they've done, they took the momentum equation, and they've kind of used the pressure gradient as the variable to, to, to fit to get the observed results. And here they plotted each term in the momentum equation. In this case, geez, I was going to be brief. I guess I'm not as brief as I thought. OK, uh, for the merid meridional component. And for example, for the meridional case, you see that the pressure gradients are the dominating force term, forcing terms for the neutral wind through the night. There is some viscous term. There's Coriolis terms. Uh, iron drag and so on. For example, this, this is in some respect the explanation why, although there is quite a bit of pressure gradient uh, all through the night, the, uh, the southward winds are not so significant until after midnight because the Coriolis effects are important. Well, I should be finishing my talk with some very profound uh, conclusion, but I think the 
best uh, conclusion for this talk is that uh, the last paper of the day is over. Thank you. There will be some announcements after the discussion is completed. Are there any questions? This this was Chattanooga work too. The last the last thing you did, the the Robles and Hayes work with Chattanooga. Yes, uh, right, right. What, what how how do the uh, 200 kilometer winds compare with the 120 kilometer winds that the radar derives? Uh, okay. Well. Okay. Well, let, let 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 me first clarify your question. Are you asking uh, on how the 120 kilometer winds that the Robles Hayes theory predicts or no? Measured by the measured by the 6300 as compared to the 120 kilometer neutral winds derived by uh, Oscar Bracker. Um, I believe the general trend is similar, and there are, however, there are very definite differences. But the trend, you know, the, the general circulation, uh, the trend of blowing, uh, blowing. Um, I need hands to talk. Uh, 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 to, you know, blowing to the west in the evening, blowing to the east in the morning, and the general southerly flow. Uh, that that general trend is is there for the 120 kilometer winds also, but the numbers are of course different, the magnitudes and and the details. The the winds themselves were made to match at 300 kilometers. It is tied in the vertical by a Yakia type gradient, and therefore there may be significant deviations the further you get away from 300 kilometers. But it is okay, locked let, in that position. Let, let, let me clarify something, because I think you miss. Uh, okay, what Ray is saying is correct, but I think he misunderstood uh, Bill, uh, Bill Hansen's question. Uh, um, well, I think I answered your question. Now, what uh, uh, Ray is explaining about his model is that he really matched the, uh, the iron, iron, dri iron drift and the neutral wind at 300 kilometers. Now, his model is such that it predicts actually neutral winds uh, at different altitudes. But on how good that prediction is as you move away from the altitude where you really did all this matching depends on how good your vertical uh, profiles are on temperature and so on. Pressure gradients, ED right, are at 300 here. Right. Although he has pressure gradients at different altitude, but that's through a Jakia type of mapping. How was the viscous term uh, determined? Because it seems from what we are doing that it's a very sensitive quantity. Uh, you need to know very well the, not only the gradient of the wind, but the second derivative of, uh, of the wind with uh, respect to height. And uh, from our experience, it might become a very uh, important component larger than the pressure. We know that it's certainly not the case, but... Uh... Why, don't, why don't you answer? Uh, yes, viscosity as you get above 300 kilometers can be very important in, in locking the, uh, the latitudinal cross-section. And what you would develop under this circumstance would be a, a, a jet that may be locked to the walls through viscosity at higher altitudes. But it is a very important thing, and we have no way to estimate it. And the viscosity here that we're talking about is just gradients in the vertical direction. Uh, I just want to raise a question. It, it, there's something that sounds a little funny here, and I, I'm sure you got the proper answer for it. No, but no. Uh, <laughs> what you said was done was that you tried to match, measure, you tried to take, a, you took an iron drag model. You took observations, and then you used the pressure term to force the fit. Well, this may just mean that the pressure term came, comes out large because of the, the model being wrong, OK? Uh, what model? The neutral atmosphere model? Or? Well, the ion drag model, for example. Because the fudge the, factor was the biggest term, what are you saying? Yeah, the fudge factor becomes the biggest term, is what I'm implying here. <laughs> okay, and, uh, married, married, uh, on, on, on the zonal case, the fudge factor was a small term. But no, I mean, sure, uh, sure, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a question of, uh, of there, there are a lot of assumptions going in. Uh, I'd, I'd like to make one more comment, since we've played around a lot of hand-waving models here, too, is that uh, 
I don't believe the biggest uncertainty is, is in, the, uh, in the drag pattern. I think the greatest uncertainty you run into is knowing the electron density profiles to use over the total high latitude region. Your, your, your number uncertainty in electron density profiles over the whole high latitudes is, is a bigger uncertainty. Well, r remember I'm, uh, that uh, specifically if these observations were made at, uh, at college, you know, so one of them were made at Esther Dome, the other one at Chattanooga, and Chattanooga does provide the yes, electron but density. But the model involves the electron density over the entire polar region. This, this is a local model. This is not a three-dimensional model. And as a matter of fact... No, uh, you, were drawing, you weren't drawing it local. Uh, originally, you, you drew a convection that's coming... Uh, you had an iron drag pattern there splitting at midnight. Oops, I went the wrong way, I guess. Uh, I, perhaps I better talk to you, Jim. I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure what you mean. I mean, originally the first uh, three, three slides, four slides, were measurements, measured neutral winds. And there was, I mean, no assumptions there. That wasn't a model. Those were measurements, measured neutral winds and measure, uh, measured iron drift. Now, the last two slides uh, where were all these so-called uh, wiggly terms in the... Oh, I think now I know what you're talking about, if, yeah, I, if I you can. So. Uh, you, you can't treat this problem locally. <laughs> I guess they closed shop there. Uh, did you want, did, <laughs> did, did you want to comment on that? The, the, Bob Dickinson and I did a, a study a while back on this, and it seems to me that if there are perturbations in the electron density, and the momentum addition due to the convective electric field is partially balanced by the uh, pressure forces, unless there is a very large scale. So only a global scale ionization distribution is necessary to calculate the momentum addition. The, the irregularities, you will find bumps and, and valleys in the pressure force, and this tends to balance itself out. There will be local eddies developed in there, but the large global scale wind will not be influenced by this irregularities. But, the, but again, your, your electron density model on a global scale is what I'm saying involves but these calculations are not global calculations. They are local calculations. And what he does, he estimates, he estimates the pressure gradients. Basically, what, it, what it's trying to tell us is that in addition to the IKEA pressure force, there appears to be an additional source due around local midnight, around breakup time. And there may be an additional pressure force that is acting to help convection along. A whole pattern over the a whole latitude region is a pattern. Okay, I think we should uh, adjourn at that point.